Welcome back, everybody, to another GSD Fails. I've got my trusty sidekick, Lee Outen. Good morning. And uh, the amazing Tim McCrate, I think I'm pointing in his direction, has joined <laughs> us. Tim, how are you doing? I'm good. It's early, but I'm good. Thanks for having me on the on the GSD Fail session. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this today. Well, you know, I've, I've taken it as a personal win that uh, over the past few years, you've kind of uh, on the sly spent some time with me and become a friend and helped me through some things. But like the fact that you're actually appearing with me in person, I think that's a ne next level in our relationship. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm looking forward to this. All right. GSD fails, everybody. Sometimes we fail in life and sometimes life becomes an epic fail. But people can rise to become something new, someone better than they could have been without the fail. And that's what we're here to talk about today. DSD Fails is a series of conversations to explore resiliency in the face of adversity. And so we're going to talk to people who have fallen and have been transformed in some way by their experiences. And in the past, we have had a lot of Medal of Honor stories uh, that we call them, like people that have gone through situations like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that, can't even imagine that. Uh, and then we had John, do kind of a, a industry fail, like a personal career fail. And this is what Tim McCrate's going to help us with as well. Um, he's going to join us for a little bit of a series. He's going he's gonna to do like two or three of these with us over the next six months and uh, talk about some career fails and lessons he's learned that we can all learn from. And if the great Tim McCrate has failed, it may be okay for you to try it as well. Go ahead, Tim. Thanks, Tim. And thanks, Lee, for, for being here today. Um, this is always hard to talk about. Nobody wants to consciously lean into discussing failures, whether it's in their personal life or throughout their career. But I think what you are doing with this movement and what you're doing for the professional security, I, I just I applaud, I applaud both of you. You are doing some phenomenal work. So I hope everybody who's watching and everybody who's engaged in, in GSD and in, in GSD fails in the kindness games that they really appreciate what you two are bringing to this and and who you've recruited and the work that you're doing. So I I just wanted to salute both you guys. You, you're just doing you're doing amazing work for us. So thank you for for you leaning into this for stepping into these types of discussions and and bringing this I think this this different perspective to the security industry and the professionals that make it what it is. So I thank both the, to Lee and to Tim. Thank you guys for for doing this for everybody. Thank you for that. Appreciate it, Tim. So we wanted to talk about oh, failure. Um, I was saying before we started the session today that this is my 40th year now in security. I started in 81. I got out of the reserves, the Canadian Air Force, uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force, the reserves in 1981. And I started as a security guard in a hotel in downtown Winnipeg. And one of my first, uh, first, but that was my first role in security, my first introduction to security. So the way I've looked at my career and some of the things that I've done has been in this arc of the early part of my career and establishing myself, then moving into the middle part where you're trying to build yourself. And then finally in the latter part where I find myself now is at the coming down off of that hill from my career. And now it's the, what do I do with myself? So if that makes sense, I kind of want to talk today about this, the first part of my career and, and what I was doing and some of the issues that I had. And it's, it's interesting. I look back at it now and you're just, oh, I can't believe I was doing that. So let me start. I got into the security industry. Uh, I, I bounced around on a couple of different roles until I finally landed in this one organization. I got into the corporate security group. Over time, as I, you know, I, I increased the skills that I had in the industry or in the profession and in the job that I had, you kept getting more and more responsibilities. And I thought this was wonderful, right? So here I am seeing the paycheck increase. I'm seeing more jobs, more duties. Uh, and, un and unfortunately, what I wasn't registering was the additional pressure and what I was putting on myself and the pressure I was placing on myself to be perfect in the job that I had, which was a horrific mistake, right? We are human beings. I, I think this last week or so, the events that unfolded in the US Capitol proves that we're human beings and we're fraught with failure. But the issue that I had is that I wasn't accepting that, right? Personally, in my personal life, in my relationships, uh, my relationship with my family, and then also my relationship with my work. So I wasn't accepting the fact that I was going to make mistakes. So I did everything in my power so I wouldn't make one. 
So I would, I started getting into work early because I thought, oh, I'm going to give myself this extra time and, and I'm going to make some time for myself and I, I'm going to get ahead of the schedule. Well, that extra time kept sliding, right? So instead of seven o'clock, it's 6.30, it's six, it's 5.30. All I was doing was setting myself up for failure and I wasn't recognizing that, right? Does that make sense, guys? Have you guys ever seen that? Have you, yeah, everyone's nodding their head, right? So, but it's, the important part for me was, and what didn't register was, I wasn't relying on others to help myself. I thought I had to carry this all on my own. And I thought I had to be that expert of every subject that I was responsible for. And that I had to be perfect in every task that I was doing. And more importantly, that if my team wasn't able to step up to that level, I would carry that team with me and I would do the work for them to catch up as well. So you can picture the pressure that I kept just grinding myself into is that not only did I have to be good at what I was doing, but if my team, if there was something, there was a gap that the team was doing, I would fill in that gap. So then all that extra work that I, I didn't get a chance to do at work, I would just bring home. And the cascade effect for that was as I was bringing that work home, I wasn't spending time with my family. I wasn't giving myself time to decompress, wasn't giving myself time to take a break. I wasn't giving myself time to really enjoy uh, any of the, you know, any of the vacations, the holidays, et cetera. Jesus, I remember even one, uh, my wife and I at the time, we went to a wedding and I remember I actually brought my cell phone to the reset, to the wedding. I was supposed to read one of the, you know, like I was uh, there to read one of the poems for the bride and the groom. And then at, right after the poem, I had to step off the stage to go take a call. Like, are, are you, are you, are you kidding me? Like, but that's who I was, right? That's where I put myself in this world is that I had to be that guy. Even on my best buddy's wedding, I had to actually st step off the stage when I was done my little, my little piece to take a call because apparently there was some kidney on a helipad waiting for me to direct it. Like you gotta be kidding me, right? Like this is, but that's what I thought I had to be. That's what I thought I had to be. And that's the, that's what I thought I had to, you know, I had to actually express as, as my, I'm a security professional and I'm doing this job and holy Jesus, someone's calling me. I, everything, I'm so important. I got to step away from my buddy's wedding to take a stupid phone call. Like you got to be shitting me, but that's where I was, right? Yeah. And how much of that is pressure that we put on ourselves? Um, so not all of us are ultra type A guys, but most people in the security industry tend to be overachievers. Uh, we want to be the best at what we're doing. But also, how much of that pressure is put on us by the security industry itself? Oh, good question, Tim. I mean, a lot of it. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so folks I know that are really successful in this industry, many of them do have that personality trait where they, they will drive themselves to complete a task. They will complete the task. They, you know, they will, they will hold themselves up to such a high standard. And absolutely that's, that's part of it. And I think that was one of my faults was that I absolutely had to be perfect at this task. Right. Um, also from the security perspective. Yeah. From within the profession, I think that's part of it too. It's the organizations that we were, you know, we're sworn to protect or the assets we're here to ensure that they're safe and secure every day. There's an expectation from management, from leadership, from executives, from elected officials, et cetera, that, well, security's got this, so we're okay. And so now, now we got to step up, right? And we, oh my God, we, we got we to gotta move forward with this. Not realizing that we make mistakes. And, and didn't we just see that at the Capitol building in the US, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't we just see what happens when you do make mistakes, right? Yeah. So you're right. I think, it, I think it's both. There's this combination that we... I don't, know about, I don't know about you folks, but I know I, I've talked to others as well. We kind of fell into the security world, right? We didn't, we didn't consciously put up our hand and going, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get a career in security and I'm going to start here and I'm going to be here and I'm going to be here. I think many of us fell into security because it was a fit for the skills that we have. And, and it actually, it complemented the approach that we took in our personal lives. We were able to replicate that in our professional lives. So for me, yeah, security was a natural fit because of the work, you know, what, how, I, how I treated myself poorly as it was but the perfection that I expected from me and then what my expectations were for my career path and that. So I think there's both to that. And maybe that's part of the problem is that we're not giving ourselves and we're not stepping back from, the, from that requirement. We're not asking questions like, well, wait a second, is that reasonable, right? right. Had I been a smarter man you know, in the 1980s, <laughs> Yeah, I got, yeah, I think that's a whole decade I, I lost there. But anyway, if you were, had been a smarter man and it had been a smarter man in the 80s, you would have stepped back and go, just a second, is that a realistic expectation for me to take a phone call about a toll fraud problem at a buddy's wedding? 
I, no. I hear you. I hear you. And I want to, I want to be like, you should have known better, um, but <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. done the same things. Um, like three grandparents funerals I've missed because uh, I was working. Isn't it? I just, we'll never get that back. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, we, we take so much upon ourselves in these roles, right? Because we're not, we're not driven the way some other folks are, I think, in their professions. The, the way I look at what we do is we're, we're the ones who are, we're the castle keeps, right? I, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to, you know, something back from medieval times is that we're this castle keep. So when the, the real paid army goes out to war, right, we're the folks who stick back and make sure we're going to keep everything safe for you. Right? So that mentality, I remember doing some research on that. Uh, because that's where my family originated back in Ireland was this concept of castle keep. And for us, it's, yeah, we, 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 we still carry that mindset is that I got this, right? I got this. I'm going to keep every employee safe. I'm going to keep every piece of information safe and secure. I'm going to protect us all from harm. Everyone go about, go about your work where I got this. Right. Yeah. Right. So this is why I'm taking phone calls in a wedding Right. And it's, it, it, it could have waited for a week, but I had to take it because my perception was that's who I was. And that's what I had to do, regardless of the effect that it had on my relationship with the person who was getting married. And more importantly, how I felt afterwards, realizing what a schmuck I was for taking this phone call. But, uh, you know, that's in my mind, that's what I had to do is I, I had to be that guy. Right? Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the perception and the assumption. We see ourselves as eternal protectors and we're here to serve what we forget and you know i'm going to use some of your words is that you had the team yet you felt that it was you that needed to do everything you 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 introduced the i in team when we all know that there's no such thing as i in team absolutely but, but at the end of the day when you're in the younger parts of your career you become i kind of compare it to a puppy you basically want to be stroked and, and, and patted on the back all the time and to get that gratification. Oh, you did a fantastic job. When in retrospect, we forget that we've got all of these tools and resources around us that if everybody is receiving those acc accolades, then that is the reward that we need. But unfortunately, it's down to the wisdom, right? And the experience and the time served where you accumulate that knowledge, where you then receive that wisdom and go, actually, I don't need to be that person on call at the time. You know, I've got a second in command or I've got this great team where they should be doing that. And where you miss is that you're not communicating that message to the powers that be basically all the powers that be think that it's just Tim, right? They don't, they may not have even known Tim's team because all, all they see and hear is Tim. No, and I agree, Lee, that's, you, you nailed it. There's, that's exactly how I operated early in my career was that there was the perception that everything had to be and like, I, tr you know, you trust your, you trust yourself, but only yourself, you, you know, you, you think that you're the only one who can make this work. Well, it, that's such a ridiculous assumption. And it's, it, it, one, it's draining. It, it, it absolutely drains one. It, it drains, I think your purpose from you, it drains your ability to do your mission better. And it takes away any idea you ever had of team of leadership, et cetera. So that for me, those lessons that I learned as I got now, you know, as I'm sitting here in this chair now and the role that I have and the roles I've had this, you know, these past five years or so, as I've gotten, at the far end of my career. That's why I love being able to chat with you guys about this is that, look, for everybody who's coming into this role, like coming into this world, into our profession and who wants to sustain a career and to be successful in it, uh, if there's an opportunity for you to learn those lessons now and, and to listen to you know cranky old guys like me who've gone through this stuff and have had enough scars in the back and enough failed relationships to realize, look, this, the way to work this, the way to be successful at this, the, the, the part of the world that we never talk about enough is, is this, right? I'm, I'm pointing to you guys on my screen. It's being able to call upon your team, your friends, your this family that we're building within the security profession and to ask for help and to not only ask for help, but to seek out the help to make sure that every time that there's 
a, a task, a project, a program, et cetera, that there's, there isn't a single point of failure, right? That there's this resilient approach to the work that we do because I have a team that I, not only have I worked with, but I trust and they trust me. So that work can be spread between all of us. Had I been smarter? So right? how, do, how, do, how do we get past this, Tim? How do we say enough is enough? I need some time. Um, there are things called principles of management, which we actually don't learn in the military Correct. or the federal service that teaches you how to train other people to be able to fill in for you. And oh my gosh, they might take my job. How do we get past this? How did you move forward, Tim? So a couple of things. So let's go, I'll take some recent examples and it's something that I reflected back on over the years. A couple of things. One, you need to train the person who's going to sit in your chair, right? And you need to have more than one of them. Uh, th this idea of resilience and being able to support when I'm not around that you, we cannot have anything cripple that chain of command. As a great example, we look at uh, every institution that goes through a democratic process to elect a, elect a new leader. Every four years, that leadership can theoretically change. There's processes in place to ensure that it does, right? Canada has that same approach in our electoral system. So does the United States, so does other governments. So for us, we also build in programs to change. If we get a new CEO, a new director, a new manager, why are we, why are we not doing that in the security profession? I think for part of it, at least for me, early in my career, was there was this fear that we weren't being recognized for how important we were in an organization, or we wanted to make sure that that importance stayed. Well, I think what we've done in these past 10 years or so is we've demonstrated we are important to the, to the business. We are important organizations. And part of that success is based on the approach that we're taking and how we recognize risks, reduce the risks and, and get that business to be successful. So what can we do, right? What can we offer new people coming into the security profession or new leaders coming in? When you can't do this on your own, you, you stop. If you think you can stop, you, you can't. You need to rely on others. You need to make sure that that work gets distributed amongst yourself and others. You need to be able to reduce and remove those points of failure and you need to build resilience in everything you do. And more importantly, for God's sake, share stuff. Talk to people. You can't just, like, so for me, it was, you know, you, you, you go home after a stressful day. What do you do? You sit, watch TV, you do something. So how about, what if, as, as new professionals coming in the security industry, you start reaching out to other professionals, you start finding a mentor, right? Those things for me were critical as I, as I wanted, as I realized that I needed to change and get better. That's when I started asking for help. And as soon as I started doing that and recognizing that I couldn't do it myself, it felt like this massive weight just drops off your shoulder. That all of a sudden it's okay to breathe now. It's okay to take a weekend off. You don't have to have your phone with you if somebody else has the phone for you. It's, it, it became, um, it, for me, it was really, it, it was this enlightened moment when you realize, oh, you mean I went through the whole weekend, I did, didn't pick up my phone and the earth kept rotating. Wow, that's awesome, right? So that, that's part of what we have to start teaching people as they come into the profession is that, this isn't something you do by yourself. This isn't a role that you can accomplish all on your own. And more importantly, as, as we grow in organizations and we gain more, you know, whether it's more responsibilities or more duties where you change positions, et cetera, move into leadership or move into management. Now, to your point, Tim, those are the traits that we have to start teaching those new leaders, just like they teach other leaders in other parts of the organization is that you can't function as a standalone unit all by yourself, right? There's this principle that you need to, spread that amongst others. You need to engage others. You need to build out your team. You need to find that resilience. You need to work to it because Jesus, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. It, this, it, that early in my career, that was um, just the stress and uh, the noise that I dealt with, the impact it had on my personal life, right? Relationships that I had with my family, with others, that stuff I'm never going to get back. Just not. Right to your point, Tim, yeah. not being there for your grandparents' funerals. Jesus, we will we will never get that time back. And and for what? Right? What can I say? I got out of all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I've gone through stretches in my I mean, short career. I was born in '81 when you started your security career. So holy crap! You're you're thanks. I feel better. Yeah, I'm I'm better. Helping you out, bro. Giving you some credibility. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, you know, I have gone through seasons to where I went and worked at work all day, came back, spent a couple hours having dinner with the wife, got the computer back out and worked again till bedtime for years. Yep. And my wife's awesome. She's completely understanding. But I realized that I wasn't spending time with my family. I had to actually go to my boss and say, goal for this year 
is to disconnect and stop working. And she was like, how, tell me how that works out. And to this day, I talk to people all over the security industry who are high performers, really smart person. And they'll say like, I left you a message, like a, a text two weeks ago. Where were you? I'm like, oh, you left on my work phone. I was on vacation. They're like, when you have a separate phone and you turned it off, I'm like, I did. I've built my teams and, and, and trained them well enough to be able to make decisions within their scopes of work. And even though I have a relatively small team, I have made sure there are overlapping or maybe not overlapping, but all of their scopes line up to basically be a program phalanx. The, you know, they, in my absence, can understand and manage anything that goes on while I'm out. I can turn my phone off and completely disconnect for vacation. And there are people that say like, I can't do that. People rely on me. People ask me questions and, and my, you know, I don't know what their org is. I don't really feel like I'm very smart per se, but you can train a group of people to be able to step in and collectively manage for you while you're out. And that's essential. And that's something, um, it's something we kind of learn in the military, actually, right? Like you need to know the job of the guy below and above you so you can step in. Um, but when we get to the corporate world, we're afraid that somebody's going to take our job and look, well, maybe they're better at my job than I am. And so I'm going to get fired. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's interesting that it's a very difficult thing to do for lots of people. And I'm, maybe we should do a whole workshop on how to do that. I don't know. What do you, what do you think, Lee? Does that... Does it that resonate with you? Does that? Yeah, hugely. Um, let's let's go about this in different ways. Like, so think about leap of faith, uh, fear factors, and failing. Yeah, when when you are young, you don't really understand, you know, what they're all about. And from a very young age, we're, we're, for me, we're taught wrongly. We're set up incorrectly. That's the way I look at it because. You're told by your teachers, by your parents, you know, by people around that you look up to, that you respect, that failing's bad. Making mistakes is bad. But as the three of us on the call and a lot of the audience that are watching it, we know that when you fail, the secret source within the fail is the growth. And it's understanding all of those. So what I always say is I encourage and I challenge my team. And I, and I always talk about my team because I can talk about that because I see that every day and I talk to that every day. And I say, if I get feedback from clients, positive feedback, fantastic. I love it. Love to give you a pat on the back. But I say to them and they look at me very weirdly and I say, I want some negative feedback because that is the only way that you young people in here right now will learn. Because if you go through your whole careers, thinking it's, I'm going to use the old Rocky analogy of sunshine and rainbows, then yeah. you, you, when it does crash and when that lack of resilience appears, how are you going to react? You know that they're not going to be able to react to that situation. They're going to crash and burn. So, and I also say that if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. You're not taking those risks. And again, it's all about taking those strategic um, yeah, risks we all have to take risks in our life to be able to, to fall forward. But yeah, the, the points I want to pick up that you talked about is resilience. If the two Tims and myself, unfortunately, were taken from this planet tomorrow, and if we haven't trained or mentored or coached or nurtured our teams, what's going to happen to those teams? They're just going to crash. But highly probable one person may step up, but do they, you know, have you you've done a disservice you have done a huge disservice to your team to your program if you are not training that person those people to be the next tims to be the next lees okay that they always and i i say i say to 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 one of the people within my organization that i've coached nurtured and trained you are better than me I'm not, I'm not scared to say that you are better than me because he's 30 years old. He's accelerated his career already. And I've passed on a lot of pearls, you know, you know, pearls of wisdom to him. And that is what we've got to say. Don't be scared yep. to share. Yep. Can, can I also ask you another question? 
Tim. Yeah. So if if we are a one man show and the failure of the entire department hinges upon uh, our presence, does that not discredit our business value to a corporation who would not allow any small department to hinge on one person? It does. It absolutely does. And that's, you bring up that that's a great example, Tim. And, and that's where, you know, you bring back the discussion point to the business. If you're not there, does the business fail? Right. And I can guarantee you in most business structures, that wouldn't be the case, but to, you know, I, I think those are great. That That's such a great example of, we should be asking those questions, right? We should be challenging our business. We should be talking about these things to our business units. And that's, you know, we, we talk about failures and, I know both of you guys have done such great work on getting away the stigma of talking about failure and, and understanding that we have to lean into this to learn from it, but embrace the idea that we are human, we are going to make mistakes and can we recognize it? Can we grow with it? So for me, you know, as, as we've been talking that for me, that the, the failure for me early in my career was thinking that it, I could do all of it that, and only I could do all of it and that everything relied on Tim to do this. And what a ridiculous assumption that, you know, one, I, th I think, the, this idea that only one person could do it, huge problem based on the concepts of resilience within security, but also what a disrespect to the team, right? I go back now as, as I've gotten older and think about that. I, I, I have always, and this is, you know, I've, I've been so blessed in my career, have worked with just some brilliant people, like just stellar security professionals and not giving them that opportunity to grow, to learn, to be part of it, et cetera. That's on me. Right? not giving them that opportunity. To that. And think about the power of that, Tim. What oh, you've yeah. done is you've suppressed their talent. Absolutely. Again, again you've done a disservice to that team. And that, that's what we need to get past so quickly and rapidly is understanding how much talent you are that's in within your team. If you inspire, empower, and encourage them, hey, it makes everything so much easier, right? And, and, you know, and it does, right? And, and now as I've gotten older and, you know, at, at the giving part of my career now, the time to give back and, and to, you know, to, to take what's left in the head and give it out to everybody, it's a couple of things really came clear in this last little while. One, I, I am not and will never be that technical guy anymore. And I'm okay with that because I'll be honest, I got some brilliant folks on my team and, and folks across the industry that I know that are so incredibly talented. From a technical perspective, I don't have that anymore. I'm okay with that. I, I can let that go because I don't need to be that person anymore. And the second one for me is now it's finding and growing that person who wants to sit in this chair. And more importantly, how can I help them get there? And then how can I walk away from the chair? Right. And that's, you know, for me, the, the last probably 10 years of my career has been that. It's this idea that I find that person set up the business for success and then have the opportunity to say, okay, right? I, 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 you, you can let this go because you're seeing to Lee's point how brilliant the people are in your team that you've given them this opportunity to grow and, to, and to, for them to own the business and for them to own the objectives and the goals and the achievements, et cetera. And for you to just slowly step back, right? So it's, it's been great to watch. And it's, I think that's, I, you know, we, maybe we can talk about that in the next session on failure is that when do you get to that point where you don't yeah. have to worry about your your ego anymore? When when are you okay when you know that your mom's okay with what you do? I don't need to impress anybody <laughs> anymore, right? Exactly. Like, stop now, right? My mom's happy with what I do. I'm good, right? We can we can leave this. So and that's I think that's that that's the tipping point. That's an inflection point where you find it in your career and you realize, and now I can just be right. Um I, I love that. I love that. And um Gosh, that was almost like a final thought. Do you have a, a final, final thought or is that going to be yours? <laughs> you know, no, you know what? I'm, I don't want to ruin that one, but I'm just going to add one more. Is that I, you guys are doing just such a fantastic job with where we are in, here in this industry. We've got, we, we've got this great chance ahead of us, I think over the next few years to really change the perception of who we are. Why did we pick this profession, right? Why are, why are we here as opposed to somewhere else? And then how do we, as we continue down this path of bringing everyone together and looking at things under the umbrella of a profession, what does that mean? But while we do it, can we do it differently than others where we give each other the opportunity to be, to fail, to have discussions, open discussions like this, where 
the three of us can share to others who are going to watch this and listen to this and share this amongst themselves and realize it's okay to talk about this stuff because this is the evolution of you and your career. This is the evolution that we've, we've gone through. And by offering this to the people who are going to listen to this session and the, and the other sessions, that there's, a, there's, op, there's this huge opportunity to grow and to learn from this and to change. So yeah, I just, just another, you know, hats off to you guys for just, just the phenomenal job you're doing, keeping and moving us forward down this path and bringing this, you know, this concept of empathy that we haven't had before and we didn't talk about before, but I think it's time and we need to do this. You know, it almost wasn't allowed. Um, it was heavily discouraged to appear to be human and have flaws. Um, but I think that's another thing that's discredited us with our organizations. They're like, I don't want to talk to robots. I'm afraid of having government agent type people in my organization. Like I can't trust people that aren't people. Um, yeah. And, and you know what? I mean, we could just go on and on and on with that. But Lee, you have any closing thoughts? Yeah. So I'm going to close on this. Someone believed in us and gave us the opportunity at a young age. Why are we not doing the same? Yep. Absolutely. And my last thought to close this session out, um, we talked about how important it is uh, to mentor and train people to take over. Lee talked about a disservice you're doing to your team if you don't trust them. But, you know, I want to say, uh, take it a step further. You're doing yourself a disservice and you're inhibiting your own professional growth. If you can't go through the painful and sometimes frustrating exercise of preparing people to take over for you, because we often feel that we do it the best, we do it the only way, and it's hard for us to see that there's other ways to do it. And in that respect, it's kind of like, you know, my, my dad told me early on, he goes, Tim, the point of marriage is not to pick a perfect person and live happily ever after. It's to learn how to coexist with somebody for a long time. And it makes you a better person because it's trial and error. It's trial yeah. and triumph. Yeah. You know what? Managing and developing people is the same thing. There's lots of rewards, but it's not always easy. So don't take the easy route. Agreed. All right. GSD fails, everybody. Out. <laughs>